And I, I'd like to think Sue Ellen will start her true summer holiday tomorrow, but it's not in her nature. Um, <laughs> Okay, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm not going to give a long, I'm not going to recite all of Jane's awards. We'd be here all night. Um, I'm going to just say first that I got to know Jane in the early 1990s when my wife Geraldine and I became colleagues of hers at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Jane was already something of a legend. She'd been the first woman at the paper to cover the White House, I think, yes. I had reported from Beirut and other foreign hotspots um, and already had this reputation. It's this very dogged reporter who went where you know no one else wanted to go and always came back with the goods. Um, she also had a hand in one of my uh, first great scoops, so to speak. Um, I, uh, this was a major uh, news story, found uh, out that a Viking-era coprolite had been found beneath a uh, Lloyd's Bank branch in York, England. Coprolite is a polite yeah, word for excrement. <laughs> um, I heard a few chuckles. Um, and uh, to archaeologists, this precious thousand-year-old piece of crap was known as the Lloyd's Bank turd. And I wrote a story about this in which I use that phrase often. And, and Jane was then an editor on page one. And it fell to her to edit the paper. I think this was the first extended conversation we had. And um, I was new. Uh, and Jane sort of advised me that um, you know this uh, paper I was working for was so prudish that even the word crotch was banned in pieces about companies that made nylons. Um, <laughs> reporters had to write of how companies reinforced uh, the, quote, area where the legs come together. <laughs> so Jane uh, wisely decided to clear my story and its subject matter uh, with higher ups. And this went all the way to the top, the executive editor, long debate. And he ruled that because scientists called it the Lloyd's Bank turd, that we could use this phrase in the paper. I can't remember if you put it in the headline. I'm and sure. <laughs> he later told me this was one of his great blows for the First Amendment. Um, anyway, Jane went on to write for The New Yorker. I followed her there. We shared a difficult editor. I characteristically bailed very quickly. Um, and Jane, um, to, true to her nature, dug in um, and delivered scoop after scoop uh, about the Bush administration's uh, secret use of torture, about the Obama administration's uh, use of drones to uh, kill overseas, about NSA uh, whistleblowers. I could go on and on. A lot of what you and I know about the kind of uh, secret workings of government are due to Jane. And then there's her most recent scoop that um, Sue Ellen mentioned, uh, the first interview with uh, Trump's ghostwriter. And one of the many chilling things uh, he said to Jane was this, I genuinely believe that if Trump wins and he gets the nuclear codes, there's an excellent possibility it will lead to the end of civilization. Uh, speaking of scary, there are also Jane's books. <laughs> um, about Iran-Contra, about the Clarence Thomas nomination, uh, about the war on terror, and now Dark Money, the hidden history of the billionaires behind the rise of the radical right. And I'll just give you one of many reasons, and then we'll get to questions. This is a must-read book. I suspect when many Americans think about the Koch brothers and their ilk, they think this is simply an election year issue when um, uh, people use dark money to try and buy candidates and maybe even buy the presidency. And I think what Jane so vividly uh, describes in this book is that these people are playing a very long game. And what she calls the uh, coctopus, although coctopus would be better, but <laughs> they pronounce it coke, the coctopus, their tentacles are in every aspect of American life, in including the education of our kids. Uh, which brings me to my first question. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in saying that this book is upsetting to read. Um, every time I thought, okay, you, you can't possibly tell us something you know, more depressing than what you've just told us, you do. Uh, but you keep this calm, measured, almost clinical tone for several hundred pages, even when you're 
writing about how the Koch brothers sent a private investigator after you to come up with manufactured dirt, including Jane going through a dog door of a former boyfriend's. But no, actually, that's <laughs> not true. Um, true. It's true, but not in the book. <laughs> so my question is, how in the heck did you research and write this book without having an aneurysm at the computer, <laughs> which is, would have been my response. I mean, I don't know, cold showers, mother's little helper, any depressants, any convulsants, just explain. You know, I, I don't know, maybe it's um, a little perverse, but I always feel so much better when I get it off my chest and get it written down. I learn these things and I think, oh my God, the country has to know this. And sometimes the worse it is, the better, I think that, I mean, when I learned, for instance, that the, that the Koch's fortune was partly based in building a refinery for Adolf Hitler, and that the two of the eldest Koch brothers had a Nazi as their nanny, I just, my, I, instead of being depressed, I was like, oh my God, this is just too good to be true. What can I say? I mean, it's like, you can't make some of these details up and um, I can't wait to share them with people. But so many people have said to me after reading this book that um, it made them um, sick that I've been feeling a little guilty. I don't know, maybe with the paperback, we'll sell it with Pepto-Bismol or something to go well, with I it. Well, I mean, her husband is in the audience. I mean, does Jane go around pouring disinfectant everywhere? Is this like <laughs> something she enjoys of, you know, rooting out filth? Or? She feels really good um, she gets something. Yeah, the gets good. the goods on these guys. I mean, no. I, it really is, but I mean, more seriously, I, I feel um, this book in some ways reflects much of what I've learned during 25 years of living in Washington and, and, and watching kind of the, the story behind the story and what's really going on. And I, I so much wanted to sort of share it with the rest of the country and all the readers. I really felt people needed to know it. And it to me, it explains so much. I mean, people worry and wonder, why doesn't Congress work? Um, or, or why can't this country move forward on really simple seeming, I mean, on, on problems where there are large majorities of both parties that agree something has to be done, like about m money and politics. Large majorities mm -hmm. dislike Citizens United. And the answer is that there are real and explainable forces stopping solutions from being reached by Congress particularly. It's tied up in money, and it's tied up very purposely and deliberately by people who I think the country should know. And so I, it was really a great feeling to get this story put together and out there and you just you know hit it out to the rest of the country so they could see it. Right. So. All right, a great, uh, <laughs> kind of nails it. All right. Somewhat related question. Um, part of what makes this book not only in, uh, you know, a great expose, but really kind of a titillating read, I have to say, is that you're writing about some like seriously awful people. I mean, putting whether or not you agree with their politics, um, you know, by day, uh, many if not most of them are essentially merchants of death, uh, <laughs> manufacturing DDT and other toxins. Uh, the nation's leading, you know, toxic chemical, chemical polluters, uh, weapons, tobacco, it goes on and on. Um, and then by night, uh, they're either, uh, I love the phrase, gutter drunks, as one of the people in your book puts it, sleeping with prostitutes while giving millions to the moral majority, or they're plotting <laughs> the overthrow of, of the government, uh, the despoilation of the planet. I could go, go on and on. I mean, there was one who's named by Forbes the greediest executive in you know, America. So my question, I, as I was reading, I was just sort of playing a parlor game with myself of like, who's going to take the cake for the most appalling person in this book? Um, and I just wondered, I have my own answer for that, but I, I was curious about yours, or on the other side, if there was someone you actually grew to admire or even like on some level. I, I hope not. I do like some of the rogue characters. I find them, you know, kind of amazing. I, I mean, and, and just to begin with, I have to say one of the most important characters, obviously, in this book is Charles Koch. And 
while you can, and I do disagree with his political point of view and, and much of what he's done with his business, I mean, turning it into the number one creator of toxic waste in this country, and I mean, the, the list goes on and on of reasons to be against Charles Koch, but he's a protean character. Um, he is somebody who is um, very much believes that ideas matter, and he is waging an ideological war on the country. And, it's, and if he were not worth $45 billion, I, I don't think that it would matter that much, but he's used his fortune to promote really extreme ideas, and it's fascinating. I mean, I found him very compelling yeah. as, a, as a character, I, I, a dangerous, scary, interesting, but important. And, um, of the characters, if I was looking for the ones that I really think of the, the minor characters, I, I suppose one of the ones that really caught my eye was maybe the, the richest man in, in, um, in, in um, I guess he was, is it Minnesota or Wisconsin? Menard, mm -hmm. um, Wisconsin, I think. He's a billionaire um, who, among other things, got into trouble for packaging um, chips for playgrounds, you know, the sort of chips that create the surface in playgrounds that were, it turned out, soaked in arsenic. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, who does that? You know, how, <laughs> how could you possibly, you know? And um, he paid a fine and moved on to the next thing. But there, there, it's a, there's, there's a lot of competition. Lots to choose from. There, were, there was, I mean, there is the woman in this, in this book who, um, her name is Susan Gore from the Gore-Tex family. And um, she was interesting. She was stood to inherit a fortune in her family that she had to share with her siblings. And it was being divided by, on the basis of how many children each, each sibling had. And she had one less sibling, uh, one less child than her siblings did. So she actually went through the trouble of trying to legally adopt her former spouse. Um, and, and, and it was thrown out of court eventually. But, um, Wait, but her ex-husband. Uh, her ex, her for, her ex-husband. Spouse. Yes, I'm former sorry. spouse. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. right. And I'm so, sorry. Sorry. Um, and he agreed to go along with it. And um, and I mean, and this really happened. And 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 stories like that made me realize because there's sort of a tendency to think, oh well, these people have enough money and they must be just acting out of sort of philanthropic or or ideological reasons. When you get to know them as well as I have, you learn that for many of them, there is no such thing as enough money. I mean, Susan Gore was talking about inheriting a huge fortune when she already had a fortune, and she was still trying to adopt her ex-spouse. Yeah. So. Well, it's funny, you met, that was my choice for at least most appalling oh. anecdote <laughs> of you know calling up your ex-husband and saying, can I adopt you to get a bigger <laughs> share of the trust fund? Um, and unless you go a little soft and fuzzy on Charles Koch from what, uh, what Jane just said, Charles and her brother David, who are really the Koch brothers that we talk about. They're actually four brothers, one of whom is gay, and Charles and David at one point try to blackmail him. Let me just right. say a word about no, that. No, this is a family that is, it's a, it's not the Brady Bunch. Um, <laughs> they, and, but it is, it is fascinating. They've, they, they're four sons, they divide early on into two teams. Charles is the, kind of the ringleader of all kinds of terror in the family, and he, he kind of adopts his younger brother David, who goes along with him, and they team up against two other brothers. Um, uh, and Fred, the oldest one, who um, is, is, you know, quite effeminate from the start, um, is the outlier in this family. They're from Wichita, Kansas, and um, at some point, Charles and a friend, according to a uh, legal document I got a hold of, um, broke into the apartment of the um, brother they thought was gay in Greenwich Village and gathered up incriminating material and um, then called a meeting of the board of the company that they were inheriting from their father. And um, it was just going to the four boys. And the, the brother who was gay walked in last. It was the setup. It was a kangaroo court. And they said, if you don't turn over your shares to us, we're going to tell dad you're gay. And um, 
So this was, though, what's interesting is this was after each of them had inherited something like $300 million, mm -hmm. and they're still fighting again over power and mm -hmm. ownership of this company mm -hmm. and getting more. So, oh, well, it's, I mean, so, it comes back to the never enough. Thing. Never right. enough. Right. And it means, I think, you know, you right. begin to think, it's interesting because you begin to think that, that, that money isn't just about money um, for a lot of, in, in these families, it's about who, which kid the father loved the most. Many of them have very brutal fathers in this book, and, and sort of, and just who wins? Who's, who, can, who can be sort of king of the hill? Well, the dad's a real doll, as you alluded to. <laughs> and, um, but um, these are the kind of details why you gotta read this book. I mean, every page is like, oh my gosh. Anyway, uh, on to- but, Okay, but one other thing you asked who I came to like, I kind of surprisingly like, I, uh, Richard Mellon Scaife, not for anything he's ever done politically, and he really is actually, I mean, I'm, the, the, the spectrum is <laughs> narrow here, um, <laughs> and the bar is low, but um, he's an interesting character, and I got a hold of his unpublished memoir, which gave me a, f a, f a feel for him, um, and he kind of realizes how bad he and his set of people are, and he says, you know, he loves John O'Hara's writing, because he says he really captures how we all drank too much and made wrecks of our lives. And, and so he realizes his life is kind of a wreck. He's inherited the fortune from the, the, the Mellon family, um, part of it. And um, he eventually puts it to building up the right wing. And by the time he's died, he estimates he's put a billion dollars into it. And he has funded, I think it was 133 of the 300 most important organizations on the right. It, it, if it, he is described by a friend as the Santa Claus of the right wing. And um, without him, I think there wouldn't be a lot of these institutions. So I mean, I'll just add as a history a mess, nerd, though. what I love about this book is that you give us this, you know, primer on, you know, a century of this right wing activism. And that, you know, as if, again, if you don't happen to share their politics, as if what they're doing isn't appalling enough, you and I are paying for it because they're <laughs> getting massive tax deductions. I mean, talk about the sort of history of how the tax code unwittingly uh, feeds uh, some of this or a lot of it. Well, so, so many of these families, um, and it's certainly true of the Mellon family, they were, from the start, um, as soon as there was a, 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 any kind of uh, income tax, they were looking for ways out of it. And, and, and it wasn't too long after the income tax was passed that, that the charitable deduction was put through. Um, and they then um, figured out a way to really engineer it. They all had lawyers and accountants who figured this out, and they created private foundations, which um, escaped taxation. Right. and allowed them to use that money to fund their political machines. And, and so I, I, they, people talk about it as weaponizing philanthropy. And all that money is avoiding paying taxes, which means that the rest of us pay more yeah. Yeah. Um, because they're getting yeah. out of it, yeah. really. So. All right, I, I got so many questions, I gotta skip ahead. I, I, I mean, of all the many things, uh, whatever, that are surprising and uh, difficult to read, for me, the, the infiltration of the academic world, uh, we, we know about think tanks, but it goes way beyond that. These right-wing you know, billionaires have established hundreds of programs, faculty chairs, fellowships, at every leading university, including my alma mater, Brown, which you hardly think of as a bastion of right-wing thought. Koch brothers and their money are there. Uh, they're everywhere. Um, so maybe if you can give us an example of that and well, how sure. it's played out. But it really goes back to, okay, so to, just to explain a little bit, um, Charles Koch wanted to launch a libertarian revolution in this country. Um, he, 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 and he comes out of the John Birch Society. They looked at American government almost like the um, communism. They want to kill all the social programs and um, pretty much get rid of taxes and get rid of most of the government and have it be a kind of a corporate free market state. So um, he first tried to push these ideas by getting his brother to run as vice president of the Libertarian Party 
to be Vice President of the United States against Ronald Reagan from the right in 1980. And they lost miserably. And after that, Charles figured that they're not gonna win at the ballot box. His positions are not popular and he can't, he, he's gonna, he can't win it fair and square. He's gonna have to buy it. And he's gonna have to buy it by subsidizing how people think in this country, and not just elections are the last yeah. stage. And so part of that means trying to uh, create these think tanks, um, but also get into the universities where they think that the, the young form their views. And, and he writes, Charles writes really back as, as early as 1980 about the only future of this movement is to capture the minds of the young. And, um, and he, they, 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 they study the universities and they think if they endow professorships, that's not good enough because um, you don't really, you lose control. The professor starts to teach what he wants to teach. So they think they're gonna have to create centers in universities that push free market thinking and libertarianism and anti-government views. And they start doing that. And, and um, they pick, they, they very carefully, they call it getting beachheads. Um, and they, they start by doing it in easy places, like small colleges where nobody really pays that much attention. But they begin to think it won't matter unless you can get the Ivy League, because that's where the future leaders are. And so they start pouring money into places like Harvard Law School to yeah. create the law and economics yeah. programs. Um, and then the, one of the best public universities, the University of Virginia, um, is they create a center called the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. It's a public university. It is practically owned by the Cokes at this point. They put $30 million into running something called the Mercatus Center there that is just the Koch's kind of think tank, private think tank in the middle of the university. And they and churn out these papers, these things that somehow, uh, whatever, uh, infiltrate the political dialogue. Well, tremendously. So, so, so Mercatus was putting out these papers that when George Bush W. became president, they made, I think, uh, you know, all these recommendations and W chose 14 out of 23 of the big changes he's made mm -hmm. on regulations came straight out of Mercatus. They were all things to destroy um, environmental regulations. Um, and some of them were, you couldn't make it up really. I mean, one of the arguments that Mercatus put forward was that it was a good thing to have smog um, and get rid of the, um, um, and have a hole in the ozone because they, they argued that that pollution and s the smog would stop people from getting um, uh, cancer from the sun. Yeah, skin cancer. Yeah, skin cancer, yeah, yeah. right. And so it's better than sunblock smog to have pollution. Yeah. And, um, and this argument actually got adopted all the way up through the appeals court level, and it was thrown out at the Supreme Court. But, but two of the, of the appeals court judges who bought it had just been at a judicial seminar that the Kochs also funded. And that's another thing they do, is fund a ton of judicial seminars that the federal bench goes to, where the judges are kind of wined and dined and then exposed to their ideology. Right. And um, I've forgotten, uh, I think it's just your line, one of the, it, that they want to take the liberal out of liberal education. Liberal uh, arts, yeah. Out of liberal <laughs> arts, yeah. right. And um, the other thing I learned from reading this is anytime you see a vaguely, um, classical sounding name like Mercatus or Cato Institute or Civitas. Look carefully. Be wary. <laughs> For some reason, um, that uh, tends to be a sign it's backed by a, uh, one of these billionaires. Or, um, or any, any institute that has a, the name of a founding father. Take a look at the board and you'll, you'll, you're sure oh, to yeah. find the, Madison, the same money. Madison, Patrick Henry, those are also right. yeah, signifiers. So. All right, moving on, a little more contemporary. I mean, Donald Trump, as we all know, uh, won the Republican nomination on the cheap uh, against a number of foes, as you document, who are getting you know millions from these right-wing uh, robber barons. Um, on the Democratic side, not the same, but Bernie Sanders refused PAC money and did just fine. 
Um, and as a result, I often hear people saying in casual conversation on the island, you know, Citizens United, flooded dark money, not as consequential as we thought. It's, it's, it's been such a, a, an interesting year for, and, and, and in some ways a disappointment for the Cokes, I think. This was going to be their, their year, 2016, when they finally got um, the House, the Senate, Supreme Court, and the White House. And so they had set aside plan, they had plans for, um, at first it was going to be $889 million, and then it went down to $750 million. Um, with their group of fellow, they call them investors, um, the big donors group that they run. And um, instead, the one candidate on the Republican side that didn't come and audition for them, Donald Trump, um, got the nomination, yeah. right? And so, um, and so this has been a little bit of an upset for them. They're pouring their money down ballot now into all of the Senate races and House races. But I think it's actually... Um, it's, it's very telling in many ways because I think that both Bernie and Trump really got a lot of um, headwind on opposing big money, saying we are our own men, we are not owned, we're not puppets, as, as Trump said. And I think it reflects that the country is sick to death of this process mm. of the donors like the Kochs really yeah. controlling things. And, and it's an irony, though, that Trump, of all people, would benefit from it, because if the choice is just between a billionaire who owns himself or billionaires who own the candidate, it's not much of a choice. <laughs> but, um, but, but just the same, it is true that, and I th think that the other thing that's going on that's, to me, is really interesting, having looked at the, the, the politics, that the positions that Trump's taking is that in, in many ways, I think the Kochs helped create him, um, and the big donors did. They captured the Republican Party and pushed it so far right to serve their own interests that they, they pretty much stiffed their own base. Um, they got the base all riled up with the Tea Party stuff. They were very much sponsors of a lot of the hate rhetoric that you hear now back in 2010. They, they let it fly. They really got people fired up. But they didn't, they, they attacked Social Security. They attacked Medicare. They attacked programs that many people who are at the base of the Republican Party need and support. And, um, and the candidates came with them because they followed the money. And they left a big gap and Trump comes in and says, I'm not going to take apart Social Security. And I think people need Medicare, but he also carries the hate message. And he right. just ran with it. And right. I think they left that opening for him. Right. Um, so right. oh, I see it as really... some. <laughs> well, um, uh, just... I also think they're standing by and waiting for the, you know, <laughs> see what happens next, because they right. have the only really. Um, the only really powerful and organized machine now on the right is the Kochs. They hire over a thousand people are on their political payroll. Um, it's twice what's on the Republican National Committee's payroll. And um, they have paid groups in 35 states now. Um, and they have a tremendous data operation and voter, you know, kind of get out the vote operation. And if the Republican Party is exploding, they're just standing by for the next oh, round. Good, so. Very good point. I mean, I guess a follow-up to that is one of the takeaways from your book is there really is a right-wing conspiracy. <laughs> um, there is. Uh, but uh, from reading your book, my sense was uh, that Obama has really borne the brunt of that much more than anyone else. Yes, the Clintons have suffered. But really, from day one, this this coctopus, coctopus, was conspiring to uh, fight back, uh, really defeat him on financial regulation, on environmental reform, on health care. So if we could roll back the clock to 2009, was there anything that Obama could have done to more effectively blunt the influence of this at the time, uh, largely unseen, huge influence? Well, I, I think he was a little, I mean, you could either call it naive or you could call it um, admirably idealistic. I, I don't know which, which, you know, people could argue it either way. But he, 
we all remember he was elected talking about how there was no red America, no blue America, just the United States of America, and it's such a, 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 a wonderful idea. But red America in the form of, of a handful of the wealthiest conservatives in the country was already meeting, um, trying to figure out how to t disembowel him and his administration. And, and he wasn't ready for it. I, I don't think he, no. I think he was shocked. I don't think they were politically on their toes. And I don't think they fought back hard enough and mm -hmm. identified what they were up against. Right. And so when the Tea Party broke out, you know, they were, they were knocked out to a large extent. They didn't say this is actually an organized effort by a, a small group of people funded by some of the wealthiest conservative interests right. in the country. And it, that's what it was. But, yeah. um, but yeah. they weren't ready for it. You, you so. should have published your book seven years ago. <laughs> well, Thanks a lot. Well, that's kind of when I started noticing that, that <laughs> something was going on was right. with the Tea Party. Yeah. Right. But it happened fast to him. No, I mean, it's astonishing. I mean, you read, really, from day one, they're already, again, these people are playing the long game, and they're, they're already at it. They, they're not, you know, it's not all about the next primary or the next election. They are... Well, and they're smart fight. that way, yeah. I think. Um, you know, so, I mean, yeah. but in terms of whether there's a vast right-wing conspiracy, as Hillary called it, you know, I think she regrets having used those mm -hmm. words. But, but I quote in this book um, some Republicans, I think it was actually um, Karl Rove at some point talking to people saying, you know, they say we're a vast right-wing conspiracy. He said, and it's 2010, and Citizens United's just happened. He said, the truth is we're a half-assed right-wing conspiracy, but we're going to be vast soon. And, and, and they uh, basically, they, they, want, they, they looked at, Citizens United very much empowered this group of people. And, and you know, they talk about mm -hmm. it themselves quite a bit. All right, so. let's move then to the left-wing conspiracy, so to speak. I mean, one defense if, or uh, apologia you often hear for the Kochs and their kinfolk is, well, gee, on the left you have uh, uh, their plutocrats. You have George Soros and Tom Steyer. Uh, bring it a little closer to home. This week, we this island will become a, an ATM for, you know, big givers to Hillary's campaign. Gee, what's the difference? <laughs> well, so I, you do hear this a lot, and um, you know, I, I personally, I don't think that huge money on the Democratic side is particularly wonderful either. Um, I think that it's corrupting on all sides, and if you look at, you look at what really wealthy donors are interested in. Um, there's some issues that the, I mean the, that almost across the board they have different thoughts about than the rest of the country. If you just look at what the 1% donors are interested in, they tend to not be big fans of organized labor, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, and that's true of George Soros, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to favor free market solutions over sort of big government solutions. And right. so there's, there's a lot, um, they favored free trade. So something that you're seeing that Donald Trump is exploiting is an, yet another position that the big donors before him were, were not taking. Right. Um, so I'm not a big fan of, of, of big money on either side. And particularly, though, um, take a look at the money numbers, though. And they, they, the, there's a lot more dark money, specifically. That's secret money on the right. It's 80% of the secret money comes right. from the right at this point. So the scale, so, is, yeah, um, the scale is different. And so you've got more disclosed donors like Tom Steyer on, on the right. um, So it's more Democratic transparent side. on the left? It is more transparent because right. they believe it should be transparent. Right. So Okay. So This is going to be my last question because we want to hear from all of you, so prepare your rants for Jane. Um, I want to try and end on a can I All right, can I just say oh, one other please. thing before I get attacked? Because people always ask no. about Soros. All I can say is, I wrote a story about Soros in the New Yorker that was just as long as the one about the Kochs. Right. And a lot, whole lot earlier, and it was when he started pouring money into democratic politics, too. But there's a huge difference. George Soros spent a lot of time explaining what he was doing and why he was doing it and telling me all about it. Right. The Kochs were so secretive. It was so hard to get them get their story. Uh, they were, they were, I've covered the CIA a lot. These guys were more secretive than the CIA. They were, we called the story covert operations, and it took months 
to smoke them out. So. Well, I mean, this is one reason only Jane could have written this book for this reason. I mean, most, you know, speaking as an ex-hack, uh, you know, I would have looked at all this and said, no way. They're so secretive that one of the wonderful anecdotes in your book is they would have, like, noise-canceling air machines at the edge of their meetings in case anyone was trying to listen in or right. tape it. I mean, that's how secretive they are. But I want to attempt to end on a positive note. Um, so I want to know what readers who despair at what you describe, you know, should do about it. You know, I know, I know, you're a journalist, you're nonpartisan, you're not an advocate or an activist, but let's just say hypothetically, you were giving advice to liberals who are appalled by what you describe in your book. What should they do? Well, so I'm actually quite optimistic despite this all. I mean, and the only reason I write these books is because I feel like if you inform people, I actually believe they do the right thing and they make good decisions and they get active. And so I'm, I actually believe in all of that. And um, I think there's a lot the public can do. I think the public, I, I think Congress, you know, the politicians have a built-in reason to keep the money system the way it is. The ones that got elected, it worked for them. But the public doesn't agree with that. 90% of the public wants some kind of reform on the money system. And I really think if you, you know, if you pressure people in Congress, they feel it and they act. I really, and you've got now, Hillary Clinton says she wants to change this. Um, she wants to see Citizens United overturned. Um, there's some other things going on in the Hill that, that if they were ever put through would make a difference. The, F, the, the, the uh, Federal Election Commission splits four and four between Republicans and Democrats every single time. There's a bill to put an uneven number of members on it so they can actually take some decisions right. and right. makes and makes you know, something simple like that would help. And on the um, state level, as I recall, like California has a little more sunlight on this than there, most states. There are great things going right. on in some states. Right. What they're, what, what the, given, given the current um, Citizens United decision, what people, what activists are doing are saying, okay, if there's gonna be an unlimited amount of big money, then what we're gonna have to do is, um, uh, multiply the power of small money. And so there are all kinds of programs going on for matching grants for mm -hmm. small donors. And right. in, a, in a number of states, they're doing it. And mm -hmm. it, it, it works relatively well. New York City's been doing it. So, right. Right. Um, though, of course, there is Mayor Bloomberg, who was a billionaire who's put all his fortune into it. But um, anyway, yeah, so I, I actually some, think that I, I really do think, listen, it's not easy. But the, re the reason I think you can believe that things can change is it's changed before. I, it, it, there's been reform on this after Watergate, um, and then eventually the money comes in again, and then you have to reform it again. But, uh, it, but this country's reformed things over and over and, and really made progress before, and I think they will again. All right, well so. that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's. Um, I have at least five more questions I could bore you with, but obviously one, we don't have a lot of time, but, and I will do my best with my 22,000 vision. Oh, okay, we have a mic. Okay, how about the one lady right there, yeah. Hi, thank you, Annie Cook. Um, thank you so much for doing this, service to the country. My question has to do with Facebook um, and what side Mark Zuckerberg may be on. I have to tell you that I think it's a huge gift that we can be all be on there keeping each other honest, citizen to citizen on there, and to the extent that the Koch brothers and others may not have their fingers in that discussion, I think it's really empowering for the country. I'm sure it's empowering for people on the other side as well. I'm a progressive independent, and um, so there's a lot of people keeping each other honest on Facebook and a lot of discussion across the whole nation where we wouldn't normally be able to talk to each other, and I guess I just want to know what you might have to say about that as an antidote to, to this situation. Well, I mean, I think social media, not just Facebook, but it d does definitely have the promise of empowering people in, you know, at the, at the granular level, which is, is, is fantastic. I mean, you know, and it also brings information out to so many people. I am, I'm really worried as a journalist, though, about the kind of siloing of information and self and reinforcement of, of, of really, uh, as a reporter, 
I'm really worried about the reinforcement of falsehoods that, pe that seems like so much of this country is, is buying into at this point. They're not, oh, you know, so there are pros and cons on the thing. I mean, it, as a tool, it could be great, but, um, you know, this atomization of, of, of uh, news is a problem. Um, so. Um, my name is Don Borat. My question has to do with what's happening at the local level and the state level. Perhaps you've addressed it in the book, but there hasn't been any reference here. And the fact is that uh, there's money going into um, state elections, school board elections, local elections, which traditionally have been um, nonpartisan. And I wonder if you could speak to that and whether or not you found that there were major contributions in a systematic way from the Koch brothers yeah, and Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, and this is when we're talking about down ballot races. I mean, the, the, the sexy race is the presidency. It's also the race where a single donor can have the least amount of, of impact because it's, it's so public, everybody can see it on TV, um, and, you know, there's so much money um, that it's, it's harder to, to, you know, have impact. But look down ballot, and, and it's amazing, the Kochs in particular, have actually been pouring money into literally school board races, particularly in Colorado they've been doing that. They, they um, have been defeating public transportation in, in some of the states because you know, they, they, they are uh, a fossil fuel company and they like to see people driving. And um, they are involved on, in legislative races all over the country. And I think actually the, of, of the, the kind of smaller races that matter the most may be judicial races, which where a little money can really turn um, the courts in, in, you know, in, in jurisdictions all over the country. And, um, and there's a lot of that coming down through this donor group also. So I think it matters a lot. I hope that the Democrats realize there's a big game being played, the long game. If I could just add, I did want to ask about that because it's huge. It just gets very technical and in the weeds. And um, you have a whole chapter about North Carolina. Part of the game is winning state legislatures that then allow them to gerrymander their states. So in both North Carolina, I think Pennsylvania and some other states, Democrats actually, uh, congressional candidates got more votes, but they get a very small portion of the congressional share because for 10 years now, it will be gerrymandered in their favor. So this is part of their long game. And in my own travels, I see it everywhere I go. It's just a huge, huge issue that we don't see it, it doesn't get as much attention as it should. The but a little, uh, you know, a little money goes a really long way at, at exactly. the, in those kinds of races. As someone so. says in your book, you know, we're in Appalachia, you know, yeah. you spend 100000 in Appalachia, that's, you know, goes a lot further than trying to buy ads in a presidential election in California. Uh, David Levitin, uh, question on the Koch brothers and the Investors Club. If the Koch brothers were to drop dead tomorrow, is there a plan in pl they have in place to, for succession to keep this going on and on? Well, you know, it's hard to know. Charles is, as I've said, kind of secretive. So he doesn't share his, his plans. He says he has one for um, perpetuity. But I, he, mostly what I think he's really trying to do, if you sort of see now, is since he's not putting money behind Trump, is he's really trying to build up these, these programs, especially in the universities. They see it as a pipeline. Um, and, and they sort of recruit and indoctrinate kids. And, and they've now put money into, it's, I think it's 305 different colleges and universities in the country where they're teaching their point of view. And that will go on beyond Charles and David Koch. So. Uh, someone up, oh, okay. Good afternoon, my name is Wesley Wilson, and my particular question speaks to Charles Koch's $25 million gift to the UNCF. To, to the what? United Negro College Yes, Fund. right, right. And should this money be taken <laughs> and accepted? Good I question. mean, because we understand the motive, but my $100 gift pales in consideration to his. Yeah, well, I, I see it. You, there, there, in the last chapter of this book is called The New Coke, Selling the New Coke. 
And what the Kochs did um, was after they did, after Romney lost in 2012, they hired a bunch of PR consultants and political consultants to tell them what went wrong. And they did all these focus groups and um, a lot of research, market research, and they came back and were told, people see you as greedy. Um, and so you're gonna have to change your image. And the best way to do it, they said, was to show, make it appear or show that you have an interest in, in people who are hurting. Seem philanthropic and form alliances with, uh, with surprising allies. At that point, they started pouring money into the United Negro College Fund. And I see it as very much part of their image enhancement. Um, and, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's, it's great for the fund, but it's at a very high cost because you're, you're you know, whitewashing their reputations by taking that money. It's very hard for places to turn it down. It's, this has happened not just there, but with a lot of other organizations. It's happened with tons of organizations in the arts um, and all these academic institutions too, because all of them want the money, um, but it meanwhile is giving publicity you could barely buy to the Cokes, so. Isn't there a David or Charles Koch Hall of Natural History or something at the Smithsonian? There is, yeah. um, and it's and it's about evolution. But one of the yeah. one of the uh, arguments it makes is that mankind has evolved in reaction to climate change, and it's been good for it. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, there's kind of a, a, a subtext there. And I have to say about the United Negro College Fund, one of the things that's really galling about this is the Kochs grew up as, as both Charles and David, as young men, were members of the John Birch Society. And as you may remember, the John Birch Society was founded partly in opposition to Brown versus the Board of Education. And they wanted to impeach Earl Warren. And they have, you know, their, their background is in, in, you know, fighting integration and it, it's not a pretty history. So it seems very cynical to me. Um, thank you. Um, my name is John Levy, and uh, my question go you, you've both been uh, people in the press, and so th this movement that the Koch brothers have been involved in has been going on a long time. Uh, and certainly what we see at local levels, I, I would think could have been anticipated. So my question goes, where has the press been just in the last two years in looking at voter restrictions in states such as North Carolina and Florida that are liable to have huge effects on the upcoming elections? So, I mean, I, you know, I think that's part of the reason I wanted to write the book was I felt we hadn't really told the whole story. And it's not so easy to put, to connect the dots. You know, you, following the money is really hard with dark money. It's secret money. And, um, you know, we could certainly have done it better and earlier. There have been some great reporters doing it. Um, but it's, it's not an easy story to tell with people who are actively trying to hide their hand in American politics. And for 40 years, they've been trying to do that. So, um, you know, I'm sorry if we didn't do it earlier, but I'm glad we've done it now, so. <laughs> I'm wondering uh, if you think that Supreme Court justices are bought in any way financially. Well, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. There are probably many lawyers in this audience <laughs> who could answer this better than I could. Um, I won't identify a few, but I see one or two. Um, I, I, you know, I, I tend to think that, um, that they're not bought like that. I, I, though I have to say it's worried me as someone who's written a book about Clarence Thomas that he is taking so much money from one particular donor um, who's given him all kinds of fancy gifts and trips and things. Um, and the thing about the, as I understand it, about the Supreme Court justices is they're not bound by the same um, rules that have to do with lower court judges about um, you know, their conduct. So is that, am I correct in that, that they are allowed to kind of decide their own um, I, their own, when they have conflicts, they self-declare. Uh, so, I think. 
So uh, anyway, sorry, I, I you know I, I don't know anything worse than that that I can tell you. I don't but control <laughs> the microphone. I see so. people waving their hands, but I'm I'm uh, uh, I think someone back there has the mic. Sorry. I'm I'm Marshall Sonnenshine. I feel like before I pose my question. I should just establish that I'm a little left, not right of center, so that I don't get stoned to death in the Chilmark Community Center. Um, so I'll quickly say I'm a registered Democrat. I went to Brown, and, and I even teach at Harvard, so I'm, I'm a good guy. But here's my question for which I could get stoned. Um, is it possible, has it occurred to you in working through all this, that money is really on both sides of the ledger, that these guys do lose as often or more often than they win? They lost in 08 backing John McCain. They lost in 12, backing a private equity uh, magnate uh, named Mitt Romney. And they don't have anybody to, to back, apparently, in 2016. Well, again, what you're looking at is the presidential election. And what the book is so much more about is how their ideas have infiltrated America, even though they are not supported by anything like a majority of American voters. And so, um, if you sort of wonder why there are, why ideas like trickle-down economics keep popping up as, you know, Krugman describes them as zombie ideas that should be dead by now, they're promoted over and over again by subsidized think tanks, but from, particularly from uh, wealthy donors for whom the idea of no taxes is very appealing and, um, or very low taxes on the top. And so, I think you, you, know, you have to look at their ideology and not just at the elections and look at how much of their ideology has been adopted and a lot of it has. And so I think that's, that's the place to look. And um, you know, I think that, uh, as I said, it, money carries a bigger pack, packs a bigger punch at the lower level and in academia, you should know if you teach, so. Yeah, well, if I can just reinforce that, one of the, there was so much we couldn't get to in this conversation. One of the many alarming chapters in this book is about the climate change debate and about how through academia and think tanks they sow doubt, they, you know, about the causes of climate change and you can actually see sort of polling of Americans where a greater and greater number of Americans start to question climate change or whether, whether it's really man-made man and, I mean... Right, I mean, and you, know. had, you had a fair amount of Republican support right. for environmental programs. The EPA was passed under the Nixon administration. Right. And um, it's, it's, it's the, if you look at the data, the opinion has been led by the big donors on climate change who are mostly fossil fuel interests, and they have held out their money for candidates who will take their point of view. Right. And the public on the, on the Republican side has gradually followed right. along right. It behind them. Right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so. Um, I think they've, you know, they, there's, there's somebody I interview in, the, in this who says that, you know, in many ways for the fossil fuel companies, they're like the, the people who were selling whale blubber. Um, you know, it's, it's bad for their industry if there's reform, but, it, but right. it's good for everybody else. But they've right. still sort of got this hammer hold right. over Congress because right. of money. So. I know there are more hands. Again, I'm sorry, I don't have the microphone, so uh, I, you, you, you know, um, hand it to someone. <clears throat> first of all, I read a lot of books on politics, and your book is by far the best. It's eye-opening, trenchant. And uh, I think everyone should read it who's interested in democracy. The other thing is because it led me, when I start seeing the Cato Institute, I know the game that's being played. So I was really surprised when the New York Times decided to use the Brookings Institute as their front story last week about money, corporate money and politics. And I thought, who's doing the cokes at that level? Why isn't someone, that, I mean, the Brookings Institute, I thought the story was good, it was reasonable, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the Cokes are so much more outrageous. Why is no one doing that story? I mean, it may be that they feel that story is known by now, the story about Cato and the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation. I mean, I think you could always, you know, th those are great stories to tell still. If you look at their boards, th they are putting out position paper after position paper that's serving the interests of those boards and, and their big donors. But I think maybe the, the, the surprise about Brookings was just that, 
It's the unexpected um, you know, think tank to join that group because we think of it as it was founded by, it was actually founded by a Republican who said specifically that it would, should serve no partisan or pecuniary interest. And um, the fact that it too is being corrupted by money, um, donor money, and putting out think tanks that's, um, sorry, papers that serve their interests is, is a, you know, upsetting and surprising and therefore news. Well, yeah. if, I, if I can just ask so. while reading that story, while also rereading Jane's book, to what degree has all the money flowing into the Cato's and American Enterprise put, put pressure on the more nonpartisan or somewhat liberal think tanks to start doing the same? They gotta compete. Well, there's, there's kind of an arms race for who's got right. the best and biggest building and the biggest right. endowment and all, all of that kind right. of thing. But I mean, I think the most pernicious thing about these, these ideologically slanted think tanks is they, they've kind of undermined the whole idea of independent scholarship in a way. And you know, the whole idea that, that there really is just sort of a, a, a search for truth by the social sciences that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's about real things, not just sponsors' yeah. interests. Right. And yeah. that's really corrupting. Uh, no, um, really you know, so distressing. Um, but well, we got a lot more hands anyway. here, and, and Sue Ellen will have to tell us when we got to whatever. Cut it off. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jane, first of all, for being here. It's a, it's a great, it's an honor. Um, our democracy is essentially predicated on a strong two-party system. And in your book, um, you have found through your research that much of that, um, or much of the money on the right is uh, involved in less than desirable endeavors and pursuits. Um, but in your research, did you come across any uh, wealthy um, Republicans who were actually trying to promote a more responsible and electable Republican Party? I think we may see some after this election, you know, because it's, there's so many trying to distance themselves from their nominee. Um, you know, they're, 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 I interview a number of Republicans in the book, um, and, and unfortunately, a lot of the ones that I regard as really responsible and, um, you know, uh, public-spirited were people like Steve LaTourette, who was a, a congressman who said he couldn't stand it anymore. Um, he felt that his, his, that the whole business was just being bought up by unreasonable big donors who were, in his view, um, imposing ridiculous points of view on people um, that were just, you know, they wouldn't make, they, there could be no compromise, there could be no kind of um, coming together to, to, and so he quit Congress. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think some of those people will, will get organized after Trump and sort of rethink the project. Um, I don't see why they wouldn't, they're, you know, um, so, also, uh, just I'm sorry to keep j jumping in, but there's so much in this book, and one of the things is we should be a little careful about sort of merging the people she's writing about and the mainstream Republican Party. One of the really striking things is these people are really the loony right that have bought their way from being sort of John Birchers, who were viewed as the loony right back in exactly. 1960, right. into being mainstream. And, and so what's happened right. is they've, they and the story is over 40 years, what was regarded as the fringe yeah. right, yeah. who William F. Buckley called uh, anarcho-totalitarians, is right. what he called the Kochs, right. captured the Republican Party with their cash. And, and we've seen the results. It's kind yeah. of a disaster yeah. at this point. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think the question is, right now, the, the, the group of people I write about who were part of the Koch um, funding group, they're split on Trump. They're not all against Trump. Some are with him and some are against him. And the, maybe some of those who are against Trump will try to found and pour their money into a more um, responsible Republican Party. But um, we will see. So. I, I wanted to ask about something that actually hasn't come up, and that's about the Democratic Party. I have been um, observing and wonder if what your opinion is of this. 
The Republicans, the religious right, announced that they're going to go attack the state houses. They're going to pour money into the states, and they do it. And that's not coax necessarily. They may have jumped in at some point. They may have even started it, I don't know. But when I look for the response from the Democratic Party, I see nothing. And if it's not nothing, it's close to nothing. It's as if the Democratic Party pulls itself together, gets ready to get a president, and then just has no program for politics beyond that office. Well, I, I agree that I think that the, that the uh, Republicans and, the, and not really more the conservative movement, they looked at the states as a huge opportunity and they got organized and they have organizations like ALEC that they poured money into and they've, they've been really strategic. And part of the thing about when I said early on that I found Charles Koch fascinating and a protean um, figure is he is he's really smart and he's an engineer. Uh, he's a graduate of MIT and he looked at American politics as an engineer and sort of thought, okay, how does this machine work and how can I reorient it, turn it around and get a hold of all the widgets? And that's what they've been doing for 40 years. And I think the Democrats would be smart to be equally strategic and take a look at what, you know, what's where they've left the, the field to the other side. And there, there are tons of opportunities. I think, in a way, Bernie probably, you know, I mean, he's gotten so many people excited who were not in the Democratic Party, or at least not that active before, a lot of kids. Um, and, and he, you know, he may take a look at it. You know, it, it, what the big question to me is, will that enthusiasm now be turned into some kind of movement that will, um, you know, be useful at the state level and bring on new candidates and, and change? Or is it just going to dissolve? And, and I think that's the big challenge in front of one of them in front of the Democrats right now. So. This will be the last one. Yes, could, could you tell us whether the Koch brothers have a particular agenda for the state of Israel? Are, are they trying to influence U.S. policy towards Israel one way or another? Or is it... Well, so they're, they're not particularly, but one of the most um, important donors in the Koch group is Sheldon Adelson. Um, and he has uh, pledged to put as much as $100 million behind Trump now. And um, he, you know, put an incredible amount of money behind Romney and it didn't work. But um, um, anyway, and he obviously has a very um, specific idea of what he wants to see done in Israel. So... Um, and what's interesting is since they don't, they don't really care that much about that issue, but they're willing to form alliances with others whose money will be useful. Um, Sheldon Adelson is also very anti-union, and they are. So they're happy to, to kind of form a kind of a Faustian kind of bargain with people like that. So anyway. Can we give it up for Jane? Yeah, sure, thanks. Thank you. And, and please. Do buy this book. Uh, we have only scratched the surface here tonight. There's Thanks, Tony. A lot more say. where this came from. So. Thank you, Tony.